he's going to tell us his three talks, Amazing Liquid Crystals 1, 2, and 3. Thank you. Yep. Right. So yeah, my name is Peter Falfi, and uh, um, Mike and Peko asked me to talk about liquid crystal elastomers. And this is what went in the program, so this is what I'm showing you. And there really are some uh, pretty amazing things that liquid crystals do. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, I did some work in critical phenomena and also liquid crystals. I was in Vancouver at the time. The Zhang was in Vancouver writing his book on liquid crystals with a lot of excitement. And uh, so I did some liquid crystal work then, and I thought, I'll just do liquid crystal until it gets boring, and then I'll do something else. And it hasn't got boring yet. Just when you think, okay, you know, we're kind of at the end of the thing, new things come along. And so, uh, so I think it's a pretty interesting field. Now, um, <clears throat> my talk will be a kind of a complement to Mike's talk. He talked about hydrodynamics. I will not. I will talk about everything else so to speak. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he basically showed a few slides and did a lot of blackboard work. And I will show a lot of slides and a little blackboard work. Uh, here is uh, so how I imagine doing this. So the main, main thing I want to talk about is liquid crystal elastomers. And there are three lectures. And uh, in the first one, I want to talk about liquid crystals. To, to really to understand liquid crystal elastomers, uh, one needs to understand this first bit, uh, I think, reasonably well. Now, liquid crystal elastomers are interesting because they're really responsive materials. So they are they're active materials that do all kinds of remarkable things, and they're being used as actuators and motors. And so what I really want to talk about kind of the soft motors using liquid crystal elastomers. But to understand the, these, you really have to understand a little bit about liquid crystals. So I assume that you don't know uh, anything about liquid crystals. You probably do. Uh, just bear with me. But basically, I want to go through basic liquid crystal physics and try to understand how liquid crystal respond to stimuli. And in the second lecture, I'll talk about liquid crystal elastomers. Uh, some of the funny things they do, and then on the third one I'll talk about the soft motors. So I'll be, I'll be using PowerPoint and, and some stuff on a blackboard, um, and I would like to keep you know these lectures as informal as possible, so feel free to interrupt any time with questions, comments, jokes, whatever. Okay, so this is lecture one then, liquid crystals. Now, <clears throat> Here's a kind of a quick outline of the two words about the history and about this whole business of orientation and orientation of order, uh, softness, order parameters, phases, some free energy and phase behavior, and the effect of fields, how fields uh, influence the crystal. Uh, <clears throat> but before doing that, I want to do something completely different. Okay. Um, I, I want to talk about a little experiment that. Uh, you can easily do, and I didn't bring one with me, but you can imagine it. So suppose you have a rigid cylinder, like a wine bottle, for example, and you put it on the table, and you take a plastic ruler, and you balance the ruler on this wine bottle, and uh, then push down on the ends. And a kind of an interesting thing happens. So, so here's your cylinder. I heard once that the degree of spiritual perfection of a person can be assessed by how good a circle they are. <laughs> okay, so now you take your ruler and you and you balance it here. And the point is, is this ruler makes contact essentially along a single line or you can project into the plane of the blackboard, a single point. And then <clears throat> you start pushing down with some force on the ends of this ruler, and for a while, nothing interesting happens. Of course, the ruler will bend, but the contact will remain a single point. But there will come a time when 
the ruler will do something like this, and it's going to be in contact with the cylinder over an extended region. So this point is going to somehow spread out into a line, or the line will spread out into a finite area region. So there's a kind of a transition that happens, and it's kind of interesting, and uh, you can play with it. Um, and, uh, and I want to think a little bit about this transition, and this will become relevant in the last lecture when I'll talk about some liquid crystal mass and motors. So suppose you want to understand this transition somehow. So one can think of um, essentially an order parameter, um, which will be this angle theta, that is the you know, the half angle subtended by the contact region. Now, how does this work? So, suppose I'm going to plot theta as a function of the force. And clearly, for a, for a while, nothing happens. So, nothing, 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 this theta is zero. And then that will be a critical force when something will happen. And if you sort of do the experiment, then you find that something like, you will get a bunch of points, maybe something like this. So this is kind of like a transition, and uh, one way of describing phase transitions in general is to write down Landau free energy. And so suppose we try to do that here, um, how would it work? So suppose we take some free energy, I'll write it squiggly f, and uh, <clears throat> we want to write it in terms of theta, and just like in regular phase transitions, uh, for quite a while nothing happens, so presumably we want to have a quadratic term here uh, with something like some constant f c minus f. So, <clears throat> so long as my force is smaller than fc, if I only look at this first term, I want this guy to be zero to minimize the energy. And then I can add other terms here, and that's kind of what I want to think about. So when f is equal to fc, the convexity will change, and when f exceeds fc, this guy is going to want to be different, different from zero to minimize the energy. Um, but the question is, what should the next term be that I put? <laughs> and uh, so this is a question of symmetry, and this comes up a lot, liquid crystals and other systems. And the question is, do we have, clearly we'll have a quadratic term here. So you have something like, this, some constant time theta to the fourth. The question is, is there a cubic term in here? And it's pretty clear that <clears throat> it doesn't make much sense for theta to be negative. Or if it were negative somehow, the energy would have to be pretty different from what it is in this case. So the fact that the situation for negative theta being very different from positive theta suggests that there should be a cubic term here. So there should be a cubic term theta cubed. And then the question is, what should the sign of the coefficient be? And <coughs> let's put a positive coefficient in here just for fun. So suppose we put one third b here. And let's see what we got. What do you now, mean by negative theta? Hmm? What do you mean by negative theta? Well, one could imagine that somehow this point goes on the other side. So all I'm saying is, is that negative theta in this context is just not physical. Yeah, that's so clearly the free energy must recognize that somehow. So we have to have a situation that distinguishes at this level positive and negative theta. So that's why we need to have a cubic term here. 
Because if we didn't have it, then the free energy would say, oh, plus and minus theta are equivalent. I mean, you, when you talk, you don't want to have a minimum of negative theta. I don't think we want to you want, you probably want to allow a negative thing. And so, all right, so now if we do it like this, then you can see that what will happen um, if you just minimize the free energy with respect to theta, and even forget this term here, you take the derivative, set it equal to zero, uh, then we have uh, a linear term here, a theta squared. We can get rid of that by dividing through by theta. So setting the derivative equal to zero tells us that theta should be minus one half a naught fc minus f divided by the one half is gone, I guess divided by b, and so we see that um, we get essentially um, the result that the slope of theta at the transition is going to be finite. So this says that this, first of all, we must have a cubic term, and this cubic term says that we get a finite slope here. Now this is interesting because it's unusual. Most of the time, in phase transitions, you have an infinite slope here. You get a kind of a pitchfork bifurcation in many cases. So having a finite slope here is somewhat unusual. And if you do the experiment carefully, you find that this is really what happens. And if, if B were to get really small, then you would see that the slope goes to infinity like you would see in a typical uh, phase transition case. Okay. The other thing that is maybe worth thinking about is the magnitude of these coefficients. One can sort of speculate how big um, this critical force should be, how it would depend on the elasticity and the geometry of the ruler and so on. But I'll leave that to wait. So all I want to indicate here is that even in the simple experiment, there is, a, first of all, an unusual transition, which is funny in that there's a cubic term that gives rise to finite slope here um, and the transition. And uh, as we go along, we'll see some other examples of free energy which are similar, but uh, some of the um, consequences will be different from this. Okay. So, Leave this for the moment and uh, get on with the get on with the liquid crystal stuff. Okay, so. But Peter, also it seems like in this in this model you have a first order transition as well. Or? The what? Do you have a first order transition? I mean, physically, it doesn't seem like you would, but you know, the cubic 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 allows you to have a first order. So. Yeah, so I mean, if you were to plot the free energy, uh, you would have uh, on, on this side, so this is the free energy versus theta. So on this side, it just goes up. And on this side, you will have some local minimum before it goes up again. And this guy could be up here, or it could be down here. So many, many things could happen. But we are restricted to be on this side, and uh, more importantly is when the convexity changes, we want to go smoothly from this minimum to a nearby minimum here. So, yeah, so inter there are interesting possibilities on this side, and in fact in the liquid crystal free energy, we're going to be exploring what happens over here. But interestingly, in this scenario, because we are obliged to stay on this half, we are looking at uh, this branch of the fear. Okay. So, first of all, uh, I want to argue that liquid crystals are 
pretty ubiquitous. They're all over the place. Um, in, in displays, in projectors, as you know, Kevlar is a liquid crystal. To some extent, its strength comes from liquid crystallinity. Spider silk, liquid crystal in silk, worm silk, liquid crystal uh, cell membranes are uh, liquid crystal and a lot of the properties uh, that, that are essential for life come from there. Soaps and detergents, um, <coughs> slug slime, um, fat transport in our bodies is, is, is mediated by, uh, by liquid crystal phases. Uh, a lot of high strength plastics are liquid crystalline. There are liquid crystals in crude oil, things called asphaltine, sort of plate like molecules that have uh, orientational order. Lots of beetles and things are liquid crystalline. The color basically comes from that. And then there's all sorts of devices, uh, switchable goggles, and so on. So they really are pretty ubiquitous. They were discovered in 1888 by this botanist Reinitzer, who observed two melting points in, uh, in cholesterol benzoate that he, uh, he, he isolated from plants. And, uh, and basically the problem was that he had a solid crystal, and then he heated it, and it melted into a hazy liquid. And then later on, that hazy liquid at a higher temperature uh, changed into a clear liquid. And so, what was the hazy liquid? And then it turned out that this was a new phase of matter, a liquid crystal phase. Um, and for a long time, people thought that there really wasn't such a thing. They thought it was due to impurities. And it was a kind of a disreputable uh, field, as it were. And it was also disruptive. It just interfered with the conventional view of the world. And there was a, there was a lot of... Uh, lack of willingness to embrace the, the notion of a new phase. So, um, because it's an intermediate phase between a conventional crystal and an isotropic liquid, it's, it's a mesophase, and, uh, and, and this prefix meso appears a lot, so mesogens are things that make mesophases, so liquid crystal, so things that make liquid crystal phases are called mesogens for that reason. Now, what makes liquid crystals? Well, all sorts of things, uh, typically molecules or other things that I'll talk about. But the main idea is that liquid crystals are orientationally ordered fluids, so there's some kind of anisotropic things that, that we can talk about as having uh, orientation, and that could be rods or discs, or <coughs> recently people started to work with these so-called banana-shaped molecules, and there's lots of other possibilities as well. And, uh, and the salient feature is long-range orientational order, and this then leads to anisotropic uh, physical properties. And uh, so a typical molecule may look like that, but again, I want to stress that it's not just molecules that are liquid crystals, but uh, nanoparticles and other uh, microparticles as well. And I want to say a few, a few words now about orientational order and orientation in general. So why, why worry about orientation at all? So position, we know, is, 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 a, is a kind of a key variable. Um, if you have uh, a bunch of point particles, all you need to know is where they are, and you don't need to worry about anything else. But if you have a rigid object with a whole bunch of point particles, which are all somehow moving together, then you have an option of either specifying the position of all the individual components or to specify, the, say, the coordinate of the center of mass, which is the center of mass, and the orientation. So it becomes economical for rigid bodies to talk about position of center of mass and orientation. And orientation is a kind of a, it's a it's a, it's a sort of a stepchild. Um, most of most of solid state physics comes from uh, from um, crystals that have uh, periodic structure in position in 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 in, in, uh, in, in position uh, space, um, and all the consequences really come out of this regularity, but. Relatively little is known about the consequences of orientation. So, 
transitional order goes to tunnel attention. Orientational order is much less so. And one sort of interesting thing you might think about is that you can have two objects, but you cannot put them in the same place. You cannot put them at the same position, but you can put them with the same orientation. You can give them the same orientation of order. So they're sort of uh, fermions regarding position and bosons when it comes to orientation. Okay. Um, so, now what kinds of things make liquid crystals? I just want to indicate a few things. So, obviously, molecules are typically essential building blocks, and every time a new shape is considered, a whole bunch of new phases are discovered, and a lot of excitement uh, happens in the community. And so, bananas uh, end up being like that. But that can be macromolecules, and uh, and for example, DNA oligomers may include interesting crystal phases in all part. Uh, this here, I guess, has done a lot of work on these. Uh, they can be uh, cross-linked uh, elastomers. So these are actually uh, solid liquid crystals, and they, they show all kinds of really interesting uh, behavior. Uh, they can be aggregates of molecules, and there are these nice uh, so-called biotropic harmonic liquid crystals, which are basically molecules uh, whose edges like water. So these are uh, uh, hydrophilic, but the centers do not. You know, they're hydrophobic or, or, or lipophilic. And so when you put these guys in water, they tend to stack up uh, so that only the edges are exposed to the water, but not the interior highly conjugated portions. And the interesting thing about these guys is they form rods, and these rods are oriented, but that can change their length at will. So depending on what kind of uh, stresses there are, you know, they can uh, change their shape to accommodate the, the uh, excitation. Uh, nanoparticles make uh, liquid crystals both naturally occurring things like uh, gibside platelets and uh, various clays. And then, uh, <laughs> Gold nanorods uh, make liquid crystal phases, both in solution. And this is a sort of a neat phase, and uh, arguably this looks like a layered uh, structure, uh, which could be uh, a smectic type uh, order that I'll talk a little more about later. What, what's that picture of the picture? Which? It looks like a painting. What are you just pointing at? It's all really good. This? <laughs> what is it? This is, uh, this is TEM uh, of, of gold nanorods. And so the individual nanorods are lying in here. And uh, they, you can see the lines which indicate that they're sort of stacked in layers. And it looks like that there's not much order, positional order in the layers. Right? But the layers are pretty well defined. So that's just a TEM picture. Uh, there are microparticles, so uh, you know people have been making uh, funny shaped uh, uh, colloidal particles, and these form liquid crystal phases. So these are soft PMMA ellipsoids uh, in, in some sort of solvent uh, made by Mike Solomon. Um, then there are active pneumatics. Uh, this is a uh, human melanocyte, and so there's a cell with dendrites, and it's about 100 microns long, and these guys are orientationally ordered, but they also swim around and do other interesting things. But you can go the other way, uh, on a length scale, it turns out that the mantles of... What's a melanocyte? Hmm? Where are melanocytes from? Where are they? They're, they're in the skin somewhere, but I cannot give you a more detail. Um, so, yeah, it, it turns out that the neutron stars in the mantle have iron nuclei, and these iron nuclei form either rod or slab-like configurations, and they form liquid crystal phases, and the mechanical properties of the mantle neutron stars depends on the salinity. And so the time evolution of neutron stars, when you have star quakes, for example, is determined by the, the, the mechanical properties that come from the 
this one. So I don't have a picture, but I found this uh, artist rendition of a star pig and a star for what it's worth. And, uh, and finally, getting down to uh, very small length scale, uh, in, there are some exotic liquid crystal states in, in quantum magnets. And so this is a low DC ferromagnet under pressure, and it shows a pneumatic, uh, electronic pneumatic phase, which means that the symmetry of the phase at least is the same as that of a pneumatic liquid crystal. So the story is that uh, on, on all sorts of length scales, uh, one finds these orientationally ordered systems. So this is the, the key uh, underlying feature. Um, and this is what sort of uh, brings them all together. Now, <clears throat> one, one key, uh, key thing about liquid crystals is uh, <clears throat> the impact on you know, by Goldstone's theorem, which says that if you have broken continuous symmetry, you will have low energy excitation. Uh, um, and uh, this makes these materials really responsive. So you have these Goldstone modes and, uh, and because there's such low energy excitations, it means that these systems are naturally responsive to almost any stimulus, no matter how small. And, uh, and I want to say a few words about where this comes from. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with the proof of this, but it's, it's not trivial. But one can make a, a rather simple uh, kind of intuitive um, intuitive explanation of, of, of how this works. So broken continuous symmetry means that I have an isotropic fluid, say out in space, and there are no preferred directions. But if I cool it down, the molecules will align more or less parallel to each other, and they will choose a direction, and the, that direction can be anywhere. There's no preferred direction. This continuous symmetry, that direction can be anywhere on the surface of the sphere. So that's what broken continuous symmetry is. And now, <clears throat> if you think of uh, the implications of this, this sort of means that it doesn't matter anywhere where the molecules point. You could, just, you could rotate the system and there will be no change in the energy. So you would think, okay, well, maybe if I rotate molecules here just a little bit, it's not going to cost me very much energy. Because there's nothing there to kind of uh, tell you that you have rotated away from the preferred direction. And basically, this is where this comes from. And the energy of such a distortion basically goes as one over the length squared. So the, the consequence is that the energy ends up going as the gradient of some order parameter or whatever that is square. Um, and so that, that, that's sort of intuitively clear. Then you say, okay, well, what's a counter example to that? And the counter example would be, um, say, the uh, ferroelectric transition in something like barium titanate. So at high temperatures, you have a crystal. And so you have a tetragonal crystal, you have well-defined axes. And uh, when you cool the system down, and the electric polarization vector is looking for some direction to go, there's a crystal field that tells it where it really should go. And if you try to change that, then you're going to pay the price at each point inside the crystal. So there, the energy of the deformation is going to scale as the volume, whereas here, the energy density just scales as this gradient, and long wavelength uh, distortions basically cost you very little energy. But if you, if you don't have the broken continuous symmetry, then the energy is going to scale as the volume of your object. Okay, so because we have broken continuous symmetry crystals, these materials are really soft, and they are, I think, uniquely responsive. And there's one more thing I think that makes it interesting is that they are anisotropic materials. So not only are they responsive, but you can really see the responsivity. You can really see the change in the material properties because of the anisotropy. So the thing is soft, and the response is really obviously manifest. Okay, so 
It turns out then that there's this orientational order underlying all these systems. And any kind of stimulus, and we'll talk about some of these in more detail, is going to affect the orientational order. And that this is going to change uh, essentially all the properties that depend on it. So electric susceptibility, refractive index, and so on. And uh, this uh, enormously lucrative uh, LCD industry is based on just one coupling, electric field to refractive index. Right? In principle, one can exploit uh, any other of these uh, as well. Okay, now there are basically two types of liquid crystals, um, and although the, the nomenclature isn't particularly good, uh, one kind is called thermotropic, which means that the properties are temperature dependent, and the other is lyotropic, which means solvent concentration dependent. And uh, the, the, the real difference is that these guys only have mesogenic constituents, like pure liquid crystals, for example, or mixtures of liquid crystal, or lyotropics, where you have a solvent somehow, and, uh, and so these are materials like the uh, harmonic one that I showed you, where you have molecules that form the liquid crystal in a solvent, and typically all uh, amphiphilic molecules, soaps, surfactants, and so on, uh, form these uh, lyotropic phases. So this is the kind of a distinction that you will hear. I'm going to mainly focus on thermotropic materials. Okay, so liquid crystal phases, one of the phases of the most common is the nomadic phase, where simply there is long range orientational order. Molecules want to be parallel and point more or less along the same, uh, same direction. And, and if you put these between cross polarizers, they're really beautiful. Um, you get nice uh, pictures like this. Uh, these are uh, point defects at the surface in the thin nomadic uh, film. These are called bujums. And, uh, and basically, um, what happens is the material is birefringent, the optic axis is rotating in space, and whatever the optic axis uh, lines up with the polarizer or the analyzer, these are crossed. Uh, things are black, otherwise it's wider pigment and some wider constraint. So really there's uh, some magnificent pictures that uh, one can see in studying with the crystals. Uh, lots of applications, of course. Uh, and then you could ask, why, why do molecules want to do this? Why do they want to be parallel? And there's sort of two reasons. Uh, one is energetic uh, and isotropic attraction. You can imagine having two rods and if these are big polarizabilities along the long axis, then you will have spontaneous zero point fluctuations. Instantaneous, uh, spontaneous dipole creates a field, polarizes the other molecule. It creates a field, goes back to the first guy. And if you look at this, you find that the energy is minimized when the two molecules are parallel. So there's an energy reason why they want to be parallel. And there's also an entropic reason that simply pack better. Um, and uh, so it's kind of interesting, even if there was no energy, you just had hard rods that would still order if you squeeze them together uh, for entropic reasons. And it turns out that it pays to give up orientational entropy and become ordered because you get more translational entropy. So if this interesting case of getting order through disorder, you give up one kind of one kind of randomness to maximize the other. So it turns out that either one of these reasons is sufficient to form these phases. Uh, in reality both are present. Uh, probably the energy is dominant, but it just depends on the system that you have. The second uh, maybe most uh, common phase is the smectric phase that I've shown you, which is basically an amatic, but the molecules are organized into layers. And uh, again, the reason for doing this is, uh, is twofold. Uh, you have better pairing between the molecules if they are adjacent. The centers are kind of side by side, not like this. And also, there's a more available volume uh, 
to explore, and you can imagine that if a molecule here wanted to wander around this layer, it can do it without having to worry about bumping into the molecules above and below. If you didn't have a layer, the guy would be halfway in between, and it would have to find a vacancy both in this region and above to be able to move. So again, this is now, of course, translational order, but it pays to give up some translational disorder, that is, make layers in this direction, in order to be able to explore more of configuration space in these layers. So these stackings are essentially one-dimensional solids and two-dimensional liquids. How much of volume change is there between the magnetic isotopic? Is much of um, Very, very small, surprisingly small. Tenth of a percent, perhaps, of it. Uh, now, an interesting thing is what happens if the constituents are chiral. So, so what does that mean? So, instead of a rod-like molecule, you imagine that you have something like a, a screw or a threaded rod. And if you take two of these, so if you take two, two bolts and you cut the heads off and you put them side by side, you find that because the threads are at an angle, they like to make uh, a, a twist relative to one another. And so that's, that's basically what happens. And so if you take an amatic, they form these uh, so-called, uh, first of all, they, they form these uh, helical colosteries, which means that uh, there are planes uh, where all the molecules are, say, pointing vertically. Then you move a little bit this way. And in this plane, all the molecules are tilted towards you. You move more, they're tilted. And so the thing chases out a helix. Um, chirality is just a strange animal. And uh, you can imagine that if you, have a, if you have a cylinder and you draw a line along it, well, that's not chiral, obviously. But if you draw a helix on it, now it will be chiral. Now, the thing is chiral if you cannot superpose it on its mirror image. Or you can do an inversion, and you cannot superpose the thing over its parity inversion image. Now, so, OK, so you take a straight line on a cylinder, non-chiral, make a helix, now it's chiral. So you would think that the more tightly you want the helix, the more chiral it would be. And yet, when you put these two things side by side, the very tightly wound helix, there's hardly any tilt, but on the very coarse thread, there's going to be a big tilt. So that's, that's kind of surprising. The more chiral the thing, the less tilt there is. So anyway, so there's lots of mysteries about chirality. OK, so this is, this is what uh, a helical cholesterol does. So if you, you either if you make these molecules chiral, or just add a little chiral dopa that will do this. And one really interesting thing about this guy is that this is a spatially periodic structure, and it's a spatially periodic dielectric structure. So it's a photonic band gap material. It's a self-assembled photonic band gap material. And optically, this is really cool because that means that there's a, a finite region of wavelengths where light cannot propagate. Not at all. And so you can do all kinds of things with these, make mirrors out of them, make lasers out of them. You can take these materials, pour it into a glass, pump it, and it will laze beautifully for you um, all by itself. Now, if you make the things more chiral, then they want to twist more. So <clears throat> they want to form these uh, double twist cylinders. So you have <clears throat> one molecule. The next one will want to twist. So as you go, it wants to twist this way. But if you put a molecule here, it too wants to twist. Right? So it doesn't matter which way you go, you end up with this uh, double twist structure. But of course, at some point, things uh, aren't going to work. So there are these phases, these so-called colossal blue phases, which are made up uh, from various packings of these double twist cylinders. And whereas the, if, if you were to look at the molecules where the cylinder join, you would find that they go smoothly and continuously. 
you will necessarily have defects in between. So they form these defect lattices, uh, either simple cubic or body centered cubic or something. So they form these pretty complicated structures. Um, the same thing happens with polysterics, uh, so, sorry, with smactics. If you make a smactic uh, chiral, then um, it, it, it somehow wants to twist, but it cannot because the layers prevent it. So you have to uh, make defects, and you get this really interesting the twist grain boundary phases, where basically you have a region where you have parallel slabs with a normal point at the top, then another uh, block where these are uh, twisted, and twisted, and twisted like that. So you have uh, defects everywhere in between. And this is another defect, uh, defect lattice. So um, this is just a picture of what a polystatic uh, heliocolosetic looks like. This really iridescent, highly reflective region. This is an image of an English bull terrier written with a laser into a polystatic cell. Uh, this is a liquid crystal blue phase. It turns out that because of this periodicity, you have reflection of very specific wavelengths, so they're kind of nice looking things. And this is a picture of a twisted gray body phase. Okay. So, uh, main thing then is that there's a huge variety of phases, and I'm only talking about a few of them. It's ferrolactic phases, blue phases, twist, gray body, bananas, all sorts. Uh, and this is only the, uh, the uh, thermotropics. Okay, so now let's talk about orientation and orientation of order. So the question is how to, how to uh, quantify orientation and orientation of order, because they want to have some kind of statistical description, and then relate physical properties to this, and then predict what the material does when you put some field up. So one needs an orientation descriptor and an order parameter. And uh, so the question is how, how to do this. And uh, of course, we're talking essentially about rigid bodies. So you can say, well, why don't you just use order angles? We all know how this works. Orientation this is, distribution function is all the information. But it turns out that that's not really uh, a perfect solution, because such a description may not respect the symmetry of the object that you have. And it may have just too much information. Often you don't want to know all the information. You just kind of want to know the essential bits. Uh, so it's interesting to look at orientation order parameters that are being used in practice. So in, in ferromagnets, uh, we have uh, magnetic moments. And there is a magnetization which is just uh, the number density times the average uh, magnetic moment. And so that's a vector. And in ferroelectrics, it's kind of the same story with electric polarization. That's another vector. So convenient order parameters are then uh, vectors, which are related to the symmetry of the constituents. Obviously, ionization has a direction, and so does electric polarization. Um, so suppose that. Uh, we want to come up with an order parameter for an ellipsoid, ellipsoid of revolution. So there are two equivalent directions. Obviously, there's nothing that distinguishes this direction from that direction. So we can't do really unique to put a vector on this thing, because we don't know where to put the arrow. So we have two equivalent vectors. And one can ask, uh, how can we come up with expressions that, that treat these two vectors somehow the same way? And uh, one thing we can do is we can just add them together. But that's not a really good strategy because we get zero. Uh, the other thing is we could make a dyad uh, by essentially taking the first and the second, the second and the first, maybe divide by two. And uh, what about this? Well, it turns out that this is pretty good. Uh, it turns out that, in fact, uh, the two terms are the same. And so we could just take either one of these. And, and that would work pretty well for us. So that looks like that's a good candidate for an orientation descriptor. We could continue. We could take uh, something like this. But it turns out, A, that that quantity is zero. And it's not necessary, because we already have something that describes the orientation. So um, 
it looks like this dyad is a good candidate for this kind of the orientation. And so the, the idea is that this thing is invariant under the allowed symmetry operations of the object. And so that's what makes a good orientation this group. And so uh, it's convenient to, to subtract the trace. So if you think about this LL guy, the trace of that is just unity. Uh, so if you take three times that minus the identity, then this is a traceless thing. And then it's nice to normalize it. You'll see why I meant it. Uh, so put a half in front of it. So this is a good orientation descriptor for an object of this symmetry. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a matrix. It's, uh, it's a second rank two index uh, tensor. And these are all the elements. And then the average value of that makes a good order parameter for the system. So if I got a collection of these things, this guy makes a good order parameter. So traceless, symmetric uh, quantity that tells us uh, what the order is. So, so these are two important ideas uh, that I kind of like you to remember uh, because these are the uh, proper order parameters for the matrix. And of course, it's a, it's a real positive um, it's a real symmetric uh, matrix, so you can diagonalize it. It has uh, three eigenvalues, but the sum is zero. So this is a kind of a typical representation. You can imagine that there are three eigenvectors, say J, M, and N. And then uh, you can uh, relate the, uh, these eigenvalues to the uh, projections of the original molecules onto these axes. And, and these averages are the, uh, are the eigenvalues uh, in this representation. And so one can write Q in this way in terms of the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. And uh, now this was a little messy, but happily, usually P is zero. See, P is what distinguishes those two eigenvalues. Usually that's zero, so the material is uniaxial. And, and in that case, things get a bit simpler. So the order parameter tensor can be written uh, in terms of just the dominant eigenvalue S and the eigenvector associated with it, which is the directional average orientation. So this is, this is typically the framework in which people uh, discuss nematics. So uh, one can uh, indicate the directional average orientation as, as uh, the, the eigenvector associated with the dominant eigenvalue. And whether you put the arrow on the top or the bottom, it doesn't matter because it appears like this. S is uh, basically a scalar measure of how well the molecules align uh, with that direction. So if all the molecules align with that direction, S is equal to 1. If they are random, the average of this guy is a third because they point equal in all directions. And if they're all perpendicular to this direction, then S is minus a half. So S goes from 1 to 0 and to minus a half. Okay, now there are three levels of description that people use when they talk about uh, crystal thematics particularly. Uh, they talk about just a director and nothing else, uh, which is really not, uh, not ideal because, uh, again, it doesn't sort of have the right symmetry. Uh, the Q tensor picture, which is uh, the right way. And then uh, the most complete description is talk about the probability of density. And one usually has uh, dynamics in terms of these uh, different uh, quantities uh, with different uh, levels of accuracy. Now the first, uh, the first uh, <coughs> phenomenological description of the energy of a liquid crystal was by Frank and O.C. And that just basically uh, talked about how much work it took to distort a uniform pneumatic. And we identified three canonical distortions. Play, where the molecules just kind of spray out like this. Twist, as I described in the case of a cholesteric. And bend, uh, when they look like that. And uh, so this is a free energy density, and it's really not even a free energy. There's no thermodynamics here. This is just energy. And the elastic constants, if you sort of think about this, have to have units of force. 
that's a useful thing to recall, right? So if the units are force, that means their is energy density. And the deformations are Goldstone modes. You have a sinusoidal uh, variation in space that each of these go has uh, the wavelength, uh, so there's the wave vector squared, so it is uh, this structure exactly. Um, and uh, the problem is that this director description doesn't have the right symmetry. Now, I want to say a few words um, about uh, these Goldstone modes because it's really nice to have soft materials, but it's a problem also because thermal excitations can destroy orientational order. So, imagine that you have a director field which is some constant and then there's some variation in space and suppose that you write this variation as uh, some Fourier expansion so I have some Fourier amplitude and there are three indices typically in three dimensions associated uh, with a wave vector and that's right, this is E, Q plus R where Q would be, I don't know, M, uh, 2 pi M over L, and so on. So we have these indices, M, L, M, and N. And then if you calculate the energy associated with this by sticking it into the Frank form, which is just squared gradient terms, then you find that the energy of the system is going to be basically so we have these gradient squared terms. You substitute this into those terms. All the cross terms will vanish when you integrate. So basically, when you do this, then you end up with just the sum of the delta squareds uh, times the volume. And there's the elastic constant up here, maybe a factor of two. So this is what the energy looks like. And equipartition says that each of these guys is half kT, little kT. So basically, one gets a measure of how big the thermal fluctuations are. And delta squared is equal to kT divided by the elastic constant uh, times the volume. So this gives you some sense of how big the thermal fluctuations are. And then when you try to reassemble things and ask how big are the fluctuations in real space, you get that the real space uh, mean squared amplitude Okay, again, you have the Fourier description here. You put the two sums there. When you do the sum, the cross terms cancel out. So basically, you end up getting the sum, single sum over L, M, N of these amplitudes. Uh, oops, sorry, there's a, there's a Q square here. And so, And so we have to do the sum over these indices. And we can do that as an integral. So forgetting all these p factors, when you do this as an integral, basically you have a q squared in the denominator. And then here you have integration over q space summing over l and n, depending on what you have. And here comes now the problem. Suppose that we are in 1D, then I just have DQ here. So this is the situation in 1D. And if you do the integral, you get 1 over Q, and the maximum 
sorry, the, the minimum value of Q is zero, right? because the elements of Q uh, goes one over the sample size, and as the sample size goes to infinity, the minimum value of Q goes to zero, and you have a divergence So the mean squared amplitude diverges, and this is the Pyro's instability. And if you do it in 2D, then you have a Q DQ, and you still have a logarithmic divergence, and that's the Mervyn Wagner theorem. And finally, when you go to 3D, then everything is okay. So a consequence of these soft modes is that you can't have orientational order in lower dimensions. And so, for example, the smectic layers that I showed you suffer from this problem as well. And that's why you don't have long grain smectic order, because you have the pyros instability, basically killing longer in order uh, when you get to large length scales. Okay, so this is one uh, one thing that's used use for the print version. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you could you summarize the the, the the essence of the Merman Wagner uh, theory of the two D case. The two D case basically says that the fluctuations will still diverge just logarithmically now, instead of algebraically, but it is still that way. Thank you. Okay. The other problem I just want to mention quickly is uh, this question of a director picture being somehow inappropriate. Suppose that you have a situation uh, where the molecules are basically uh, organized something like this in space. Okay. So <clears throat> in a case like this you have a defect, but let's not worry about what happens in here. But if you try to put arrows on these directions kind of consistently you see that you end up with a problem you end up with a singularity so it looks like if you only have this frank free energy then you get into a problem if you label things consistently you must have a place where the derivative diverges. And if this is artificial. Obviously, there's no problem if the molecules are all parallel. But not using an order parameter of the right symmetry gets you into problems. Uh, OK, what happens in here is interesting. This is a defect, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, I thought I would have too much time, and I realized that I have too little time. <laughs> okay, the other thing that, that's kind of interesting is that uh, this layered structure is not consistent with curl or bend. So imagine that you have a layer structure. So suppose you have a layered structure, just as we kind of indicated before. And that's the point, it's pretty nice. So we have molecules in these layers. And, uh, and we assign a director locally everywhere. It's going to be uniform, more or less, in this case. And suppose I do a contour integral in here, as indicated there. So I have dl, this um, vector element of length. And you can see that this contour integral is basically just counting the layers as it goes. Right? That's all that happens. And if I don't have any defects, 
when I got back to here, that integral must be zero. So if I have no defects, that integral must be zero. Uh, but of course, I can write that integral as the curl of that reactor field integrated over the area. So it turns out that to have layers, one must have the curl of M expelled from the material. Right? Otherwise, you would have defects. And so there's this nice story that when you take an amatic and you pull it down into the smectic, you have to expel the curl of M. So the elastic constants associated with the terms containing these diverge at the transition. And one can make this nice analogy that N corresponds to the magnetic potential, and the curl of N is like the B field, which is expelled from the liquid crystal in analogy to uh, the Meissner effect. And so Eugene proposed that. It's a kind of a nice parallel. Okay, mean field theory is a liquid crystal. So, um, the first mean field theory was created by Max Born, famous guy. He assumed the vector order parameter and it was singularly unsuccessful. And this is like uh, bad poetry written by a good poet. So, it's nice to see that uh, you know, all of us are not, you know, not we're not always infallible. So, um, the, the first successful theory was by uh, Alfred Salpa, my Salpa theory. And basically, uh, the idea was, he just said, let us suppose that we have anisotropic polarizability, and then the interaction energy of two molecules will have this form, where the sigma is the orientation uh, descriptor, and then you can build a single particle potential. Basically, you say that, uh, let me add up uh, all the contributions to all the other molecules, so you can replace this by its average. And there's this perennial problem of uh, this is the energy of a pair, and that gives you the right torques and forces, but you overcome, so you have to subtract half the average. And now you have a single particle potential, and you can just bang your head in the usual way, uh, just like the partition function. Once you have that, you have the free energy, and you're pretty much done. So the free energy is a function of the order parameter tensor, uh, and that describes pretty accurately what happens in, uh, in the matrix. And uh, so when you do the minimization, you get the self-consistent equation, Q in here, Q in here, but you can solve it numerically, no problem. Um, now, it, it's kind of interesting to take this Landau, so, so take this Meyer self energy, and you can just expand it as a power series in Q, and then you get a Landau expansion, and you get this nice uh, change, uh, possibility of change of sign with temperature in the, in the quadratic term, and this comes out because of the competition of energy and entropy. And again here, you get a cubic term as well, and this is uh, interesting. And uh, here the sign ends up being negative. And then people can say, okay, we can relax the condition that these coefficients come from here. We can just draw the coefficients in here and see what happens. So this is in 3D. In 2D, mm -hmm. there will not be a cubic term. In 2D, two, two dimensions, there will not be a cubic term. In two dimensions. Yes. Uh, <coughs> because there are no difference, there's no difference between a disk and a rod in 2D. Because you can't have a cubic invariant in 2D. Well, so you can have molecules in 2D that point in, in 3D, and in that case you would have it. But if you restrict the orientation to Y in 3D, then that's right, you wouldn't have that term. And so, so that's a really good point. And so what you want to ask yourself is simply, can I make a cubic term with the order parameter that I have? And uh, it, it, it turns out that in, in this case you can. Because you have a Q that you can contract with itself three times. So, if, so you can make a scalar out of these guys, right? No problem. So you have a cubic term. But if you have magnetization, for example, you couldn't have a cubic term. Because you cannot make a scalar out of three M's. Right? No way to do it. 
So symmetry plays an important role. And in fact, so this is this interesting notion that if you have a phase transition between phases of the same symmetry, then you can always make a cubic term. Because even if you need a vector, you will have a vector there because the original state will have the same symmetry. So, phase transitions between, between states of the same symmetry will always have a cubic term, and so they typically are first order transitions for that reason. And uh, phase transitions between phases of different symmetry may or may not have a cubic term, okay, because we, here we are breaking symmetry, but we still have a cubic term. It just depends on the system. Okay, uh, forging ahead. Uh, all right, so then you can just minimize the thing. You can write Q in terms of the eigenvalue, not too exciting. Main point is, uh, is, is that, uh, You have uh, you know the number of solutions uh, when you minimize the free energy. One is that S looks like this. The other is that S is just uh, equal to zero everywhere. And uh, corresponding free energy corresponding to this line is just this. And uh, the free energy corresponding to this line is this. So this guy corresponds to the stop curve. Okay, and then of course, what does the system do? Well, it goes on here, and then it falls down there. So, <clears throat> typically, there's a phase transition. Of, if, if, if you were to heat your system slowly, you would end up up, you would go up to here. At, at, at this point, you cannot sustain an ordered state anymore. You must fall down. If you're cooling, uh, that corresponds to this. If you're cooling the thing down, uh, then uh, you can undercool and have a phase transition here. If this state becomes unstable. That's the kind of uh, but the phase transition uh, actually happens somewhere in between. So there's hysteresis. Uh, both you can both uh, superheat and supercool. Phase transition takes place in this point. First order phase transition. Okay. And then one can do lambda thing, which is even easier. Replace the Q's, just write in terms of eigenvalues. You get something that you can solve trivially. You get the same result. Okay, so this is kind of important. Main thing is, is that you can easily describe the temperature dependence of the order in the system. Now, Ansager uh, showed that if you pack hard rods, something pretty similar happens. Uh, so if you imagine, uh, if, if, if you try to ask yourself this question. If I have a rod here, um, how will it prevent the center of this molecule from occupying bits of configuration space? And so this guy here will exclude a volume this big uh, to the center of this molecule. And uh, on the other hand, if the molecule is a perpendicular, then you get a different volume. And you see that they're pretty different. This goes as d squared L, this goes as d L squared. So it's a huge difference in this the volume depending on orientation. And uh, so then you can write this in terms of the orientation description of sigma. But the main thing is, is that orientation really, you know, really has a lot to do with how much free volume there is. Uh, and uh, <coughs> you can then write this uh, so on the average with one guy interacting with his neighbors and uh, average volume per molecule. And so this is a lot like what happens in the case of the attractive potential, you know, this kind of coupling and some average value. So the structure is really similar. And I don't want to spend time uh, uh, dealing with this. Basically, one can uh, derive the orientation distribution function only due to steric interactions, or one can put both steric and attractive parts together and one can get the whole story in, the, in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, so one gets a self-consistent uh, pseudo-potential that has the attractive part and a hard steric part, which means if you pack things hard enough, you know, this thing is going to really play an important role. Okay, but it doesn't matter too much, so you can get the equation of state, 
if we had other things, order parameter, that's the change, pretty much everything. Okay, now, one important thing is, 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 is this question of how do these uh, materials interact with fields? And so the whole notion is that the, uh, the uh, <coughs> polarizability is anisotropic. So if you want to know how big a dipole moment you make, when you put a molecule like this or a particle like this in the field, you have to project the field along one direction and assign the right polarizability, and in the other direction, assign that polarizability. And so you find that the polarizability is a tensor that depends on the orientation linearly. And if you take the average polarizability, then you see that it's linear in the order of another tensor. And then if you forge ahead and calculate the dielectric tensor, in the usual way you write the polarization as the polarizability times the number density, then you find that the dielectric tensor has an isotropic part and a part which is proportional to the order parameter tensor. And the same thing is true for the magnetic case. These things are pretty anisotropic. The relative uh, dielectric constant typically has an anisotropy of 10. Um, it's, but there's also diamagnetic typically, that's also anisotropic, but the anisotropy is, is really small. And uh, then when you write on the free energy, you've got, say, the Landau expansion, and then uh, the coupling to the order parameter is quadratic because you have a second band tensor, so you have the two electric fields that couple to it. Or if you write it in terms of the scalar part, then it just gives us close square theta uh, in both uh, the coupling of the field, the electric field, and the magnetic field. Okay, so you could ask, uh, can you make uh, can you make a linear coupling, for example, between the order parameter tensor and E? And, and you cannot because you can't make a scalar between the free energy. So the coupling is quadratic. Uh, but interestingly, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to make a point here is that the molecules, if the free energy is minimized if the molecules align with the electric field because of this anisotropic polarizing motion. That's, that's what happens in your lab. This, this term here makes the molecules line up and the pixels to change color. Uh, if if uh, they're not parallel, a torque is exerted on the material, and the torque is just E cross E. That's the torque density in the ball. And you can think of it in, in two ways. If you have a DC field, then you get sort of positive charges at one end, uh, negative charges at the other end, and, uh, and the positive charges want to go up, negative charges want to go down, and so you have a net torque aligning the molecules with the field. If you have light, things get a little more interesting. It turns out that in that case, uh, you have uh, light, say, propagating this way with linear momentum. And there's actually a displacement of, uh, of the uh, photon trajectory changing the angular momentum, the extrinsic angular momentum of the photon. Just like if you had a in a periscope here with two mirrors, uh, light would cause it to turn that the radiation pressure. So light will also cause these uh, molecules to line up the same way. Interestingly, the magnitude ends up being just the same. Um, okay, so there are applications of these torques. Um, what happens if Q varies in space? So well, we just put in the square gradient terms, all the possibilities. And that one gets a whole bunch of terms, including the Frank terms that I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk. Um, not key. Now, there are some interesting uh, questions one could ask. How big are the uh, coefficients in the Landau expansion? And that's kind of important. And, uh, and, and you can easily see that they are basically kT divided by a molecular volume. And it has to be that for dimensional reasons. And so you can right away estimate how big these things are. Uh, so that's a good thing to remember. 
how large are the caves? Well, dimensional analysis says that they have units of force, so there's some energy, presumably T and I is the transition temperature, so there's some energy, and to make that into uh, elastic constant, you have to divide by a length, and the only length you have is the length of the molecule. And uh, the gen uh, said this very beautifully, and right away you have it, and uh, if you try to measure this experimentally, it takes you a long time. Um, so, so this is really a beautiful animation uh, argument. Uh, you can ask how much work do you have to do to vary the scale and order parameter. And because of the lambda coefficients that basically scale like this, uh, in the energy density, but what is the cost of changing the direction of alignment, the director, well that just goes into the elastic constant times q squared. And you can see that this term is going to be a whole lot smaller than this if the wavelength of distortion is longer than the molecular wavelength. Right? So it turns out that um, distorting the direction is a whole lot easier than changing the degree of order. Um, all right. In the remaining uh, 30 minutes. Um, what happens at surfaces? So, well, at surfaces, again, this is the symmetry argument, you can define two vectors. There's a surface normal. That's a good vector. And you can do something to the surface. You can rub it. You can uh, corrugate it. You can do something to it. So you can introduce another vector uh, in the plane of the surface. Uh, and then you just construct an energy which looks something like this. You have Q, and it must couple to these vectors. Only sort of, uh, lowest of the coupling you have are these. And these, in fact, form the experimentally verified uh, surface energy structure. So this is pretty much as, uh, as you might expect. Now, there's a really interesting thing that happens. Now, you, you know, there's this, always this issue of surface versus volume. And uh, essentially, all animals up north are big because they want the uh, bulk to dominate over the surface when it comes to heat loss. Whales go south to have babies because the babies are small. So typically, um, when things get big, the bulk dominates over the surface. But in liquid crystals, if you look at this goldstone mold business, if you look at this term, uh, you know, this will go, if, if I have a sample of size r, and I have some distortion, this guy will go as 1 over r squared, this guy will go as r cubed, so this thing is linear in r, whereas the surface term just scales as r squared. So one has this really unusual situation that for large samples, the surface dominates. So if you have a big drop of liquid crystal, the surface tells it what to do. If you have a tiny droplet, the bulk tells it what to do. They're all parallel. So the surface effect dominate for large samples and we use it. Okay, uh, surface preparation, uh, not that interesting. There's lots of interesting ways you can modify the surface. Uh, you can uh, blow smoke on it, for example, you can go in the direction. And you can use light to, to modify the surface. Um, okay, now dynamics, how to do dynamics? Well, um, the basic idea is essentially to look at entropy production. Uh, uh, you know, this is a typical approach that people have. You know, dissipation is equal to the rate of decrease of the free energy. And if your dissipation is essentially just friction, some viscosity time, some velocity squared, then uh, you can write the free energy uh, time dependence as a dependence on Q, and you get the simple uh, dynamical equation, which is basically a nonlinear diffusion equation uh, for the order of another tensor. I won't uh, talk too much about that. There's various examples that are interesting, but I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about how. Uh, Typical display devices work, unless uh, somebody is interested in that. But I want to say a few words about symmetry, because symmetry arguments play an important role. And what is allowed by symmetry is, is, is uh, essentially something observed. 
And uh, so back to this issue of you cannot make a linear coupling between Q and E because you cannot make a scalar. But if you have a gradient of Q, now you can make a scalar. So you can make a linear coupling if you have a gradient uh, of Q. So if you have a spatial invariant Q tensor, you can have a gradient. But now, <coughs> if this is in the energy, then this guy must be the polarization because it cannot be energy. So one has this really strange business. Now, suppose you take the dielectric tensor of a liquid crystal, which is linear in Q, and you say, let's see what happens if it varies in space. So you take its, uh, you take its uh, divergence, and you end up with a vector. And if you write Q in terms of the director and the scalar value, then you get uh, these terms. And you get these uh, uh, remarkable terms. You find that. Uh, if S is a constant, you get these terms here. And you find that if you distort the director field, you must have electric polarization. And you do. So it's kind of like flexible electricity. You distort the dynamics somehow, and you have electric polarization that you can measure. And this may be useful for energy production. Right? You can take a material, you can play with it, you can make electrical energies. Maybe more interesting is that if you let this degree of order vary in space, you can get electric polarization. So if you have a, say, a temperature field, so S is big here, small here, you will get electric polarization as a consequence. Um, okay, then there's this whole business of uh, vectors and pseudo vectors and so on. So everybody knows about uh, proper vectors and pseudo vectors. Um, but the, the story is true in general for tensors of every rank. It's true for uh, scalars. So the proper scalars, vectors, tensors, third rank tensors, and so on. And pseudo ones. And so the pseudo ones basically change signs on your inversion. And it, chirality is, is a good example of a pseudo scalar. You take the cross product of two of these vectors and dot it with a third. When you invert your coordinate system, the scalar changes sign. So a pseudo scalar is kind of a signature of chirality. And uh, the magnetic fields are pseudo vectors because they come from a cross product of uh, current and uh, distance. Uh, the levi civita energy symmetric symbol is a pseudo guy. And so the world can be divided into these things, and you're saying, what's the use? Well, it turns out that it, you can say something cool things about it. So suppose you have a dynamic, then you can form a dia. Right? You can form a vector, you can form a dia. If you have a smack tape, you can, you have the layer normal, you can make another dia. And if the material is chiral, you have a pseudo scale. And from these quantities, you can form a proper vector. You just take these things, and you can make a quantity which is a proper vector. If there's a Levi Civita which is pseudo, pseudo scalar, two pseudo things make a proper thing. And so you will have a vector, a proper vector. And if you know that there's a vector there, an electron will know that there is a vector there, and you will have ferroelectric polarization. And Bob Meyer predicted this, uh, God knows, back in the 70s. And since then, people made like 50,000 materials that are ferroelectrics based on this symmetry consideration. There's the same story about banana molecules, which are achiral, so they have no chirality. Uh, but it turns out that they form uh, chiral structures, again, because of similar symmetry arguments. There's some director dyad, layer normal dyad. These guys have real dipole moments. And so from these things, you can create a pseudo scalar. Ergo, you must have chirality. OK, so the symmetry arguments are kind of interesting. You can do lots of fun things with them. This is, uh, a graduate student made this work of art to take the chirality from these uh, banana shaped molecule layers. Uh, the 
nanoparticles linked to crystals. I won't talk about that. And it's interesting to think about particles of other symmetries. So suppose you don't just have rods or discs or bananas. Suppose you have tetrahedra. What, what would the order parameter be? How would you define it? Um, how, if somebody gave you a bunch of them, how would you know that it's orientation in order? What physical measurement would probe that? It turns out, interestingly, that the order parameter of the tetrahedra is a third rank cancer. Is kind of, you know, we don't deal with these. There's no sort of standard eigenvalue decomposition, eigenvalues, eigenvector. It's a pretty interesting animal in its own right. Uh, is a theory. Well, it turns out that uh, Lenny Fowl did a nice new field theory, and uh, our Leo here, and Tom Lewinsky over there in the last paper, and uh, Europe was in 2004. So it's interesting to think about other systems with other symmetries and what kinds of structure you take it for. Okay, so here's a summary. Orientation order is ubiquitous. Liquid distance are soft. Symmetry considerations give some. I'm sorry I had to rush through, but I think these are really interesting things. And when I talk to Mulgrams, I'll mention this again. And there's lots of prospects for interesting new stuff. Now, uh, what to remember for the next lecture Basically, this definition of the order parameter and how we can write it in terms of a scalar and an eigenvector. And that the free energy has this structure, this kind of coupling to the field, temperature dependence, and, uh, and that the lambda coefficients basically scale as k, p, and i over molecular volume. And that's the next time I'll talk about elastomers and what the consequences of having orientational order to the elasticity is. Okay, thank you. Any questions?